Hi, this is Bootstrap Algebra, Lesson 15, Piecewise Functions. So let's uh, recap a little bit of what we did last time. Go to Bootstrap Algebra, Courses, Algebra, latest version, which is still Fall 2020. And um, we had been looking at uh, inequalities. We learned a new data type called um, Boolean, and then we learned some functions that can deal with Booleans in this compound inequalities. If you remember, we had Sam the butterfly in um, Sam's yard, and we had functions uh, on screen or um, safe left and safe right, and those worked. But on screen only worked one way. Only worked with safe left because we, until this lesson, didn't ha have a, the ability to, to do a function that could do two things and make decisions. So that's what compound inequalities did. We learned about the AND function that uh, was able to take on screen left and on screen right and show uh, or enforce SAM being safe on both sides. So we changed the on screen function to have an AND in it to check AND safe left and safe right. And Sam was able to stay um, on screen in the game. Hopefully you also uh, updated your, your game file. And you can ch um, see how your target and uh, your danger, uh, you could, could put use the uh, Boolean functions and add some behavior to your target and your danger. So we need to learn. We're going to learn about piecewise functions. You should have open this page for piecewise functions. You should have open your We Scheme. Go ahead and be logged into We Scheme. We'll definitely use it in a minute. So you should remember piecewise functions from algebra. Just in case you don't, let's go and, and just Remember some things about piecewise functions, and I think uh, they're easiest to, to think about when we look at the graph. So if you remember, a piecewise function um, still obeys the vertical line test. So if you remember the vertical line test to see if, some, if a um, certain equation is a function, the vertical line can't hit it in more than one place, which means that for any given input or x coordinate, then we only get one output. We can't get more than one. So all these functions here look like they uh, obey the vertical line test. But we mostly looked at smooth functions, or thought about up until now, smooth functions that don't jump from place to place. But a piecewise function can jump. So in, in this function, for the domain from negative infinity to it looks like about negative 2. Oh, yeah, and we can see here, you remember when we write out piecewise functions in, in algebra notation, we usually have multiple, um, the domain split up into multiple sections. And then this is what it looks like when it's graphed. So we need a way uh, to, to do that uh, in our programming language. That's what we're going to talk about today. And when might that be important? Well, here's an example. Boxes of candy cost $2 each. We've learned about what revenue is, what cost is. So uh, a graph of the revenue would be a straight line with a slope of 2. So if I buy more boxes, it costs more. If I buy fewer boxes, it costs less. And that's a, a straight line function. But in real life, you know, when you go to the store, sometimes if you buy a lot of candy, it actually costs less. So in this example, at a certain point, the 21st box only costs a dollar. So our function is going to be straight with a certain slope. And then all of a sudden, when we buy 21, the cost is going to change. So it's not a straight line. It looks more like those functions we just saw where um, the function jumps around. It's still a function because it passes the vertical line test. But at one place, and let's, let's go ahead and look at that example again.
So at one place, it's going to jump. I don't have an example for this exact you know, box of candy example, but it's going to look something like this where it's going to have one value up until one place and then all of a sudden it's going to jump. The, they've, they've just made a bunch of crazy ones here for these examples, but I don't see one that's going to look quite like our box of candy example. Yeah, in programming we deal with real life stuff and I don't know what the real life example of all of these are. Um, but we're going to have a, a function that, that, that's going to jump at one point. So let's uh, go to Alice's Restaurant. Uh, open uh, if, uh, the Alice's Restaurant starter file. I'm going to copy that because I'm logged in in Firefox over here. But wherever you're logged into we scheme, open this Alice's Restaurant link. And here is a new um, file. Hit Remix. Now that's our version of it, right? So when we come over to the regular set screen and refresh, now we have Alice's Restaurant in ours. So we have our own version of Alice's Restaurant that we can play with. And then also open the link, out, Welcome to Alice's Restaurant. This is uh, just a notice and wonder exercise. So go ahead and print out this or use a, a document and answer these four sections. What do you notice about this code? What do you wonder about this code? What are some familiar things you see? And what are some unfamiliar things you see? So go ahead and pause right now and look at um, this code here and fill in the sections on this exercise. Okay, great. Hopefully you were able to do that. And let's see some things that I noticed about these. Familiar, new, what function was being defined? What's the contract? How do you think this function works? So let's look through that, and I'm going to do it here. Well, the um, design recipe tells us a lot about this function cost. So cost is going to take in a string and return a number, and it consumes a menu item and produces the cost of that item. So what are some familiar things I see? Well, here's a function definition. Here's cost. Here's the variable item. Um, we don't have any examples for this function cost, and that's because we're going we're gonna to do them later, so they didn't want to give them away to you. Um, I, we have not seen this function call before. We know it's a function call because it comes right after the paren. All right. And we haven't seen this notation where we have these square brackets so that's new but inside here here's a function call and it's it's something called string huh right which we know from our convention that um, it's going to be a boolean it's going to have some kind of boolean output and then this equals is uh, also a convention for is it so it's going to be is is this string going to be equal? So it's going to be a Boolean output, and it's going to have this item that came in, and it's going to say, okay, is this string equal to hamburger? And we know Booleans like that, right? We learned about Booleans. And so here's this new function, string equals. In fact, let's experiment with that a little bit. Hopefully you experimented a little, or you can stop right now if you want to. String equals, oops, got to spell it right. And I'll say hi. I'll say hi because it takes in two strings, right? Because item is a string. And true. All right. Alt up. And let's do by false. And that's all it does. 
This compares two strings. When we use it with the literal strings like this, it seems kind of silly. But you can see if we use it in a function, then we can check the thing that we got passed for different values. And then now we can kind of understand what cond does. So cond is going to take a bunch of these items. So if we look here, we can see, and they have it split up on different lines. There's one square bracket group, another, 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 and another. So there's one, two, three, four, five square bracket groups. So it looks like cons can take unlimited square bracket groups. And then it just, what, with the way cond works, you can go to the documentation if you want to right here and look about cond. But the way cond works is it takes a, as many of these groups as we want and it checks them. It has booleans. So here's a boolean. If it's true, then this is the value. And when it finds one that's true, then it's done. It doesn't look at any of the others. So sometimes in computer programming, we'll call that short circuit. So no matter how big this, this list is, it could be thousands of items. But if I pass in hamburger, it's only it's going to stop. It's going to uh, if I pass in hamburger, it's going to stop. It's going to give me six, and that's it. It's going to be done. So the value of this cond, right? We can tell where that matches up. So the value of this cond is the one that's true, the first one that's true. If none are true, then we get else. And that makes sense. That's the way else works in English language. So there's this special word else. Uh, let's look here. Is this defined? So it's, you can't use it out here, but you can use it inside a cond. And that just means if everything else was false, this is what I'm going to return. It's optional. You don't Cons don't have to have it, uh, but it's a good idea to know uh, what happened with your cond. Um, so if uh, everything else falls through, you know, which means that it was all false, then this is what's returned. So one more time, cond takes in a bunch of these conditions and evaluates each one from top to bottom. And the first one that's true, that's what it returns. And we see, takes in a string, returns a number, and here are the numbers over here. So if this one was true, I'd get 6. If this one was true, i get 350. If this one's true, i get 525. If this one is true, i get 225. None of them are true. i get whatever's in the else. So that's the way cond works. Uh, yeah, and that's all we had in here. So hopefully you saw those things and you um, noted the unfamiliar things, and now you know all about cond. All right, your homework is going to be the uh, Alice's Restaurant Explore. So we'll briefly look at that. That is on this page, Explore. All right, and it's going to ask you just, and that's why there's no um, examples in the um, uh, example code they gave us because they want you to evaluate it. So they want you to uh, run this, run Alice's Restaurant that you made a copy of and answer these few questions about it. So this shouldn't take long, but that's going to be um, after we're done. Ah, so here is something a little weird about the materials. So in uh, the example we have for uh, Alice's Restaurant, it's cost which makes sense because you put in an item name and you get back a cost. It looks like it used to be named order. Uh, oh, yeah, it looks like you used to put in maybe multiple things. So I'm not going to use that slide, but, but over here in this... Good. So Rouse's Restaurant Explore has been updated. So that shouldn't be confusing. If you look at this, these materials and need to go back and look at the, uh, the explanation, then you will see in here it did used to be called order. 
Okay, so it used to be called order. Um, it's not called order anymore. If we look at our version, there's no order defined here. So um, there's only two functions, cost and sales tax. And sales tax looks like some of the ones we, we wrote before. So cost and sales tax. Um, so order is the old name for it. Cost is the new name for it. And you, you only see that in this uh, explanation here. So that's just the way it used to work. And same thing, it would be cost. It's going to give you back the cost. And the way they defined it, right, they took in the uh, thing that changed. So this is just walking through the design recipe that you've seen. You, for this lesson, don't have to write any new functions. But it's just explaining the cond like I just did, where cond can take as many of these square bracket conditions as we want, checks each one with a Boolean function, and when whichever the first one is true, that's the one that um, is gonna, the number that's going to be returned. Okay, I want you to just stop really quickly and tell your partner, answer these two things about a square root function, you know what a square root is, and absolute value. So think of those, and stop right now and talk to your partner about that. Okay, so um, we can, and, and you know, if, if you have trouble thinking about it, let's look them up. Square root... root graph okay here's a square root function here's a good one so if I put in two so I can only put in positive numbers I can never get out a negative number in a square root, right? So I would say that's not piecewise, right? It's a it's actually a smooth function, and um, my domain I can put in any positive or non-zero number. I can put in zero, right? Because I get zero out. But we restrict the range so that I can't even put these in. Oh, sorry, we restrict the domain, so I can't even put these in. And that leaves us with a smooth function. So now let's look at absolute value. Interesting. The, the domain is unrestricted. I can put in any number I want. But if you remember absolute value, when I put in a... I get the positive version of that. So if I put in 2, I get positive 2. If I put in negative 2, I get negative 2. And a lot of times we'll use absolute value for distance. So we might not say negative distance. doesn't matter whether I'm going from my house to my friend's house or my friend's house to my house. It's always a positive distance. So an absolute value always gets you the positive value. It just strips off the negative sign. You can also think of it that way. So the range is, the domain is unrestricted. But it's a piecewise function because we have this area right around zero, or at zero, where it abruptly changes. So, square root is not a piecewise function, I would say. An absolute value is a piecewise function. And it's perfectly fine if you need to look up the graph of these to think about them. And that's our last slide. So don't forget your uh, assignment to do right now or to do before the next time is to do the Alice's Restaurant Explorer, which I have it here as page 49. It may or may not be if you printed it out, but Alice's Restaurant Explorer, and it's going to be um, 
use that Alice's Restaurant uh, Wii scheme uh, that we remixed and loaded and saved into our section. Thanks.